Hello, and welcome to Moments with the Master for this seventh, um, to be the 18th day of October 2021. I am the Egg Friar, Father Josh from St. Martin's Celtic Catholic Church, joined with my brother, brother, brother. Um, and I am currently sitting in a hotel because I've got drilled this weekend. Um, which is why it looks like I'm sitting on pillows with a bed behind me and the light is terrible. Um, Chris is in, only in New York. Um, we are looking at the readings for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, which are Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 11, Psalm 33, verses 16 through 21, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. As always, we encourage you to read them all for your own self, but um, I am going to uh, just read the gospel, and I'm going to focus on one thing very narrowly. A lot of times we talk about the story and the background and all that stuff, but I just there's just one thing that I want to deal with. Um, so, Mark chapter 10, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? <clears throat> Excuse me. And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must also be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Um, so first of all, I love the idea that James and John are like, hey, give us this thing. And Jesus is like, well, can you be baptized in the baptism that which I'm going to be baptized? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, well, you'll get baptized that way. But sucks for you. You may not get what you want. <laughs> um, what's interesting to me, because, I, you know, what did he mean? I literally just thought about this. Like, what did he mean by baptized in the baptism with which he's baptized? So we know John, correction, James was beheaded. So he did die for his faith, although he wasn't crucified. Um, John died a natural death of sorts. I mean, he was exiled, but um, he lived to pretty much. So I, that's an interesting question to me. I don't need to answer it right now. I'm just, just an interesting thought. Like what did Jesus actually mean? But I want to focus on the last portion where Jesus says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What did Jesus mean? when he said, I came to give my life as a ransom. First of all, when did that happen? And secondly, what does that mean? Are you asking? Sure, because I I know you and I have discussed this before that you don't like the idea of substitutionary death theology. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus says there. Um, I have not exactly ransom. So I mean, so I want you to make not not that I'm at odds because I think um, there's there's a couple of points that I want to make here, and um, but go ahead. I, I will say that the Isaiah verse very much sounds like substitutionary atonement, um, uh, penal substitution, um, and. Also, um, the the Hebrews verse where, um, let's see. No, it just talks about him as the high, as the high priest. Um, so, okay, there are, there's a, there's a great book, which I highly recommend. It's called everyone. the Bible. Uh, yes, uh, uh, called Christus Victor. 
And it's about the three theories of, um, really two, they, they talk about two, uh, theories of soteriology, meaning what, what it is that Jesus did, how exactly he word, accomplished. Define huh? the words for those for those for the for the two people that are watching this that have not like what is soteriology? Soter means savior, so saviorology, the study of the savior. Um, actually, uh, the study. No, of that's a different one. Wait, wait. Uh, huh. There's a no. This is totally not important. So I'm going to skip that and get back to what I was talking about. Uh, one is penal substitution, which does not there, there's hints of it in Augustine um, and then definitely later on in Anselm he talks about it pretty extensively and then absolutely in uh, in the reformed theologians um, the other one is so uh, what is some, so again this so I and, and the only reason I do this is for two reasons because um, I'm, I'm pointing this out or I'm have defining terms for those that are watching that know things and talk about things. Like when I preach, I try to really dumb down what I'm saying. That's probably a bad way to put it, but simplifies a better way. What I'm saying, because the average person doesn't use the language and doesn't know all the time, the meaning it's the same thing I have to do when I talk about army stuff. Like I have to define terms all the time. So what is penal substitution? Define that. Uh, C.S. Lewis would agree with you, by the way, because he said, um, if, you, uh, if you preach and the people that you are preaching to cannot understand you, then you are a bad communicator. Um, okay, so penal substitution. Let me read the Isaiah verse. Uh, it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when he makes himself an offering for sin. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So the idea is that Excuse me. we have eternally offended God, and he cannot forgive us. And so Jesus had to be born innocent so that he himself could be punished for our sins as a righteous man suffering for the unrighteous so that God could forgive us, which I talked about once with the question, I actually got in trouble where I, at the religious school where I was teaching at the time. I said, God apparently cannot forgive sins because if our sin was paid for, then God didn't actually forgive it because it was paid for. Like when you forgive something, that means that the payment did not have to be made. Like if, if I, if I steal 20 bucks from you and you say, give me back my 20 bucks and I give it back. And then you say, okay, I forgive you. There's nothing to forgive. I paid you back. The forgiveness comes when you say for the love that I bear you, I make the 20 bucks as if it is nothing because my relationship with you is more important than the 20. But penal substitution says, as I understand it, God cannot forgive us because, because he is so holy that he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. And therefore Jesus is punished for our sins. The penal is the, like prison, the punishment and substitution is Jesus. He is, the punishment is substituted onto him. So that's the first theory which the book says is the newer one. The ransom theory is the older one. And there's other verses that support this, which says we are in occupied territory. We are in prison that we have become subject to sin and to Satan and to death. And that Jesus came to pay the ransom for us to get us out of where we were, not not in order to appease the father, but well, like, like Aslan did. Um, as a matter of fact, Aslan in, in uh, The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe is a perfect analogy of, of ransom theory. Um, also probably why C.S. Lewis named his hero from the space trilogy, uh, Dr. Ransom. Uh, so those are the two theories. Space trilogy, by the way, if you're not familiar, 
fantastic set of books by C.S. Lewis. Paralandra is the best description of Genesis outside of Genesis that, that I've ever read anyway. Um, so th those are, there's other theories, but those are the two that um, are most common, one in the West and one in the East. So one of the things that we have to remember, there are a couple of things. And, and so, and these are all gonna tie together in some way. Um, first of all, um, Jesus wasn't speaking Greek to the, to the apostles. Um, he was not speaking Greek to maybe. them in private. He was maybe speaking Aramaic, but almost certainly speaking Hebrew because the rabbis taught in Hebrew. That was the religious, in the same way that um, Muslim imams teach in um, Arabic all the time, even though they may speak other languages and be in other countries. Um, they will teach theology, if you will, in Arabic. But um, so John, as he's recording or writing um, what Jesus said, he's having to translate from Hebrew to Greek. Um, secondly, this we we forget and we we talk in terms of past present future um because that's how we exist so when did jesus die when did jesus um die as a ransom well there is a passage and i don't remember where it's where it is off the top slain of from the head. foundation of the world uh, slain from the Revelation. foundation of the world Yes, thank you. That it's not, we, we, we cannot forget that the events of eternity are not time bound. And so Jesus, it's not that like where, what Jesus is saying in that moment is not at a future date, I will die as a ransom, but um, the way it's written and the way um, he would have said it in the original language, to the best of my understanding, is that I have died and am continually dying. It is an ongoing process that um, will be complete. Um, not, not will be complete, but has been completed, is being completed. Um, That's actually... One of the things that people say, I'm sorry for interrupting, one of the things that people say, certain groups of people, is that Jesus had to die in the way that he did in order to fulfill um, the Old Testament law and the sacrifices. <clears throat> but that, my understanding is that the Old Testament sacrifices never accomplished a thing. And in the same way, when we celebrate the Mass, we are not re sacrificing Jesus that both in the past and in the future wasn't just a foreshadowing. It was a participation in that one eternal moment when Jesus was crucified. Right. Um, it, when, when God, the eternal gets killed, uh, that, that is a universe breaking moment. Um, and so anything, our, our linear understanding of anything becomes irrelevant. Right. The third thing is, and you, you have to look back again at the Hebrew like underpinnings of what Jesus is saying there. Um, there's, there's actually several ideas tied up in this, but the one that resonates with me a lot is because when we think of ransom, we think of, and that there's a movie actually that I think of immediately that I think is called Ransom, but where like somebody is kidnapped. And so you have to pay a ransom to, I was watching some show last night. Can, um, can I break in real quick? Yep. A, a, a really great and intentional movie that did this was the one um, Denzel Washington did it. And Dakota Fanning was a girl that he was protecting and she was taken by kidnappers and he trades himself okay. for her. So so the idea is there is someone that is evil who steals you and then you have to pay. 
but that is not the image that is. So the words in Hebrew um, talk to talk to atonement. You've used that word. I'm going to adjust real quick. Talk to atonement. Um, so it's the idea of like you've you've talked about this before. You know that that we 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 have our sin and. Jesus covers us, the sacrifice of Jesus covers us. And so we're still, you know, sinful underneath. But the idea of atonement, uh, and I love this at one with God, at one meant is, is it was, a, it was is, a made up English word to try to to try yes. to do the yeah. It's a washing. It is a full cleansing. It's not that we take the the wickedness that we have and we cover it with the righteousness of Christ which I have heard many Protestants talk about. Um, and and Catholic, some Catholics too. We are completely washed clean. Um, of Now, again, you're like, well, I'm not clean. I still sin. But it's, again, you're thinking again in linear moments and in not in an yep. eternal perspective. But the second one, and I like this even more, is the idea of the kinsman redeemer. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go back mm -hmm. to the book of Ruth, um, Ruth, her husband dies, as does her sisters. Uh, or her, no, I'm sorry. So Naomi has two sons who marry two Moabite women. Um, the, her, Naomi's husband dies as well as the two men. And so the two women are left. And so Naomi says, go back to your families. And one of them goes, but the other one, I think it was Orpah was her name. Um, and then the other one, Ruth says, no, I'm going to go with you. And so they return to Bethlehem to live there. And, and so she is, um, and this, this, this whole thing, is just a beautiful image of what Christ did. So she's living in Bethlehem, she because it's two women, they can't get a job. So she's gleaning the edges of the field and the droppings from the, the harvesters, um, which is commanded in the Torah. And, um, <clears throat> and so Boaz, the owner of the field, sees her, um, feels some sort of way about her. And so he goes and God had made provision that if the that if a, a man died without family, that another near relative could redeem the the widow and marry her. And so he wanted to be the kinsman redeemer. And so, but and then they found out there was another one, there was another person that was closer relative, and there's this whole story. Anyway, Boaz winds up marrying Ruth. Um, there's some fun shenanigans that go on and Ruth winds up being a um, like the great grandmother of uh, David. And then, of course, in the line of Christ, kinsman redeemer. So who kidnapped her? Nobody. He had to pay a ransom for her. He had to redeem her. But what was he redeeming her from? He was just redeeming her from her situation. It was not her fault. She had done no particular wrong. Um, she was just in that situation. So as I understand it, Jesus' ransom, it's not about Jesus or God paying a ransom, if you will, to Satan because Satan doesn't own us. Um, it's a false claim. We are always um, and eternally the Lord's. Now, we may not we're only part of God's family if we choose to follow, but we are always there. So who gets the ransom? It's we are being redeemed from a situation that is out of our hands. Not a, Adam and Eve made a choice to break God. And so do we all. But the sin nature that we're born with has is, has, is not our doing. It is not um, institutional sinfulness. What's that? Institutional sinfulness. It's like institutional racism, but applies to everybody equally. Okay. I think. It's actually one of the reasons, it's one of the ways that I understand institutional racism and institutional sexism. It's not by intention necessarily. It's not because of any ill will or any, any particular decision by a person, but 
it gets built into the society in the way that like if you it if you take away sexism and racism and you just say institutional sinfulness is built into society i don't think any christian right. that, that hates institutional racism as a concept would would disagree with that um because it's readily apparent so then there's other particular ways in which it works out uh anyway go ahead so, sorry so am i bound to death yes because of the the brokenness of this world through sin it's a disease yes we are and so am i am i set free from that am i redeemed from that yes i am um but in some odd way god and christ pays pays the ransom that seems really weird it's one of the problems that that theologians had with that because they were trying to figure out to whom it was paid right there's some verses that kind of make it seem like it's paid to god the father there's some verses that make it seem like it's paid to the powers of this world meaning satan there's some where it seems like it's being paid to to death um um so it's it's uh yeah that that is let's go back to the idea of ruth born as a gentile she is outside the family of israel she is not a Jew. Well, there were no Jews. They, they, they. She was not an Israelite. Sorry. Uh, do you, you know the um, Hanukkah song? Yes. Uh, Adam Sandberg. O.J. Yeah. Simpson, not a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's not. The, the reason I say that, I hate. The reason I say that, the word Jew comes from the when the Israel and Judah split up, and then Judah went off into captivity. And Jew, Judah. Not one of the chosen. Now, she was, yes, she was not an Israelite. And so not only, but now, is it her fault that she's born as a Gentile? No. Is it her fault that her husband died? No. Is it her fault that she is in a foreign country, foreign to her, um, with no, no prospects? No. And he redeems her. So as I read this and I read it differently now than I used to, is it our fault that we are born separated from God? No. Is it our fault that, um, fault? I mean, we choose to sin. So my sin choice is mine, but that's the thing. It, Jesus, it's almost as if Jesus redeems me from myself not from Satan. Satan doesn't cause me to sin. I am more than capable of sinning all by my own self. Um, the devil you, made me do read, it is the worst excuse ever. Go ahead. Have you read um, Feet of Clay from Discworld? Yes, I've read them all. One of my favorites, and, and he obviously was a humanist and not a Christian in any sense of the word. Harry Pratchett, um, by the way. <laughs> Harry Pratchett. Um, the author, he was when Captain Carrot um, purchases the receipt for the ownership of Dorfel for a dollar. He and he doesn't know what to do with it. So uh, every the um, there were golems, which are if you don't know what they are, they're like big clay human looking things. It's a piece of Hebrew understand. Hebrew mythology. Yes, from Hebrew mythology. Giant clay they're, that they're using is kind of like robots in the yeah. story. The giant clay figure. <laughs> And they're like big monsters, and you could you would Put write on a scroll, in there. huh? Yeah, yeah, you would write, write on a scroll, scroll what their what their job was. Think mm-hmm. robot with programming, but they would write it on yes. a scroll, and you would put it in the the golem of um, oh gosh, what events? I, there's a there's a story that I heard, mm-hmm. but anyway, you would put it, and that was what would drive it. That was what would make it do whatever it did. Uh, so he buys, he buys the golem. He has the receipt, the receipt and, and puts the receipt in his head. So now he's um, himself. And I, more than buying us for himself, although I think that he did, um, I, I think Jesus gives us back to ourselves. To who we are so really meant to be. ourselves to him. Yes. Yes. He, so we are, so, um, uh, well, you know, 
who you the greatest will be a servant, whoever would be first must be a slave. I mean, Jesus, there, there's this constant image of the fact that we are bound. I think Hebrews is this Hebrews passage talks about it. we are bound in chains to our sin. And when I think about that, I mean, I I think about, well, I, th I think about me, forget everybody else. I think about the places that I go almost every time if I'm not, um, if I'm not careful. But Jesus set me free. He set, he is setting, and he will always set me free from that bondage. And I don't, although sometimes, so what does Paul talk, Paul talks about, um, and was it Romans 7, you know, what I do not do, I, I do, and the things I want to do, I do not do, a wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? <clears throat> and that's a very specific image, because there was apparently a Roman punishment, like if you were a murderer, where they would bind you hand and foot, face to face to the body of the person you would kill, which would probably cause you to go insane. And mm -hmm. it's if Jesus, he sets us free from that. Now, sometimes we go back and we embrace that corpse, but we don't have to. We are free to be who we really are, which is to be in bondage to Christ and in bondage to each other. So Jesus redeems us. He ransoms us, but in the kinsman redeemer sense of the word, not in the kidnapper sense of the word. and allows us to be his bride. I think I'll stop there. I could talk Amen. about this. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.